Chom, come on. We're gonna we're gonna talk our way through through our site. <laughs> and Teresa, if she comes, we'll also talk through. We'll the demo while. Uh, uh, we've we gives the voiceover. Right. We we may sometimes have URLs that have test in their name. We we split our site into a test version and a and a live version, and we'll be jumping back and forth. Sham and I were in the midst of merging these two to get a homogeneous user interface, same headers and footers throughout. It's not just subclassing. So it starts with a live um, interview um, where the patients will be introduced to the website and where we'll elicit information from them, oh, sorry, where the physician will elicit information about, in this particular case, menopause and heart disease. Because if you go under estrogen or a, a, a plant version of estrogen, phytogen therapy, you might be more subject to cancers and heart disease. And we want to find your risk factor and uh, let you be educated about um, what the risks are. We want to have this site be also a, a place for alternative medicine. So doctors traditionally trained in Western medicine won't know what's coming in alternative medicine. But at this site, patients and um, experts can post information. The name of the program for the six conditions, uh, menopause being one, diabetes another, uh, four other ones, partners in education. That's what our doctor, Dr. Susan Oliverio, set up. And she's trying to get funding from pharmaceutical companies. They'll fund these group visits because there's actually a physician present. There's actually a medical questionnaire being given. But she hopes that uh, the interaction between patient and patient, group and group, patient and doctor, will be more important than the actual uh, uh, medications being prescribed. So the pharmaceutical industries will be giving more benefit than they know. Let's, let's stick with that for a minute. Oh, okay. That page you had there. So th this one is running on Oracle. Uh, AOL server plus Tickle, and uh, we are not using ACS, except we pulled out a few DB database libraries to uh, procs, which we load up during AOL server startup. Uh, the way the site is designed is uh, the client at this time thinks that it's going to be a totally private site. That means you couldn't browse on this from outside the internet without being able to log in. So if you didn't have a login and a password, you basically can't see anything of the site. Um, <clears throat> so once you have one, and here is an example of, say, a user who comes on who has been given a, um, a login and a password by the physician when, say, this patient first met with the physician. So we decided we're going to use the email as the login so that it's kind of easy to remember. And then you type in your password, and it lands you into a customized page. And what this page basically tells uh, this particular user is uh, three things. One is uh, some relevant content on the site, which would be useful to this particular user. So we have a question answers um, billboard system, and then a place where they can post questions and get answers. And suppose you posted a question, and then you logged in, then you would find that if someone has answered that question, that those responses would be pulled up out here. Uh, the other thing is uh, new questions which were posted, say, during the past few days or since your last login, would come next. And then uh, any new articles which were posted by some of the physicians who are the expert article builders or writers would also pop up next. And then finally, these people can belong to certain groups. So they might belong to a Monday morning group or they might belong to the diabetes group. Right now, the site is just designed for the menopause group, but it can be potentially extended to other disease or uh, disease-related groups. So uh, suppose you belong to a couple of groups, then it, those groups would pop up. So basically, uh, it gives you an overview of uh, your content or uh, what you're interested in on the site. So what do you guys think of this page? <clears throat> what do you like? What don't you like? Looks cool. Seeing appearance? Why do you think that is? This is a hot graphic around. Okay. So I'm trying to think, you know, what principles can you distill from this? No graphics? Yeah, definitely no graphics. What else? 
people don't come for the site for graphics. Okay. Color Me Beautiful Consultant. I don't know how many you saw, what was that, Roger and Me, where he goes and gets, Michael Moore goes and gets Color Me Beautiful. It's quite a good movie. Okay. What else? Were you saying something? No. It's kind of clear what kind of link, because it's in blue, so it's Default link colors make it clear where you can go. All right, what else? What about the information design? What do you like and not like? I'm not sure what. There's borders. That's one thing that is a bit of a margin. Right? It's a sort of trivial presentation point of view. I think that's contributing to the user satisfaction with this. It's a little tough to determine. I, I see mm -hmm. now. But I looked at it carefully, the asking a question thing over there. Yeah, um, this is a bit hard to pick up. Was, before I found that, it didn't look like I could actually do anything except read this stuff. Okay. Okay. So not clear where the action is. What's one way that you might be able to separate that more from the other things? Well, use a button like I use used to clicking or, or separate it from the content somehow. Right. So the, operate, the observation to use a button translates into, turn that into an HTTP post, mm -hmm. little form with no inputs. Uh, again, a graphic designer would probably go and substitute some kind of GIF for the default browser rendered button. So that might distinguish this action item from <coughs> being pure browsing action. Um, any other ideas? Would you move that anywhere else? We have, we have actions up at the top right, though I guess I shouldn't be. <laughs> <laughs> The meat of the page. Yeah, one, one action up here. That's yeah, a, there's the, actually only two actions. Right. Other, other, other so sheets will have more actions. Right. That's where the user yeah. will be habituated to look. I see. So this, the pages always have actions up here at the top right. That's a good thing. If you came in as an administrator, there would be another action up at the top, which is to jump into administration. So for me, the one thing that's missing here, mm -hmm. uh, I, don't, I wouldn't want to see this read responses to my questions. I want this to read sort of my open questions or my questions, mm -hmm. basically showing me uh, that the system is keeping track of what, I'm at, what I've asked, and then you know maybe count up the number of responses next to it or show a new response flag or something. Okay. Um, but I think the fact that it's hard for me to tell where I, where I am in the system, which questions I've asked, which has which been answered, uh, that to me could be an improvement. All right, is there anything else you want to show about the system? <clears throat> the other thing is um, this pops you into what we call recent, which we, I think, have a default one of week. seven, one week right yeah. now. Um, and new uh, basically pops you into since last login. Sometimes it's not very useful when we're testing, testing it because your last login is only five minutes ago. So, for example, out here, nothing happens. Mm -hmm. You get nothing back. Uh, this is kind of a potential bug in using last login. If a person keeps logging in and out uh, during the course of a day, it turns out to be a useless action to do. Uh, so we're back to recent, and all basically pulls out uh, everything since the system started up. Yesterday. <laughs> in, this case, in this case, it's yesterday. Yeah, we, we have a SQL file with inserts in it. We constantly rebuild our, our database. So. Uh, Recent and all are very constant. Then uh, we have a section where you can go inside and edit your information. It seems to be broken right now. Basically, what you can do is if you wanted to update your email address or if you wanted to change your password or if you want to put in a new telephone number, then that would pop up. Basically, that's the information which, which would be visible to anyone else in the system when they looked you up. Uh, for example, say you wanted to look up this particular person, and what it does is it gives you the name, it will give you an email address, uh, in which probably not. We have a so problem. Backing away from that. Right. We have a problem with the email address. Initially, we display the email address, but uh, the person who wants the system thinks that email address shouldn't be visible. Unless you're the physician or an administrator, or unless you want to email the leader of your group. So that kind of security is built in. So basically, the idea is that um, anyone else who is a user of the system shouldn't be able to see the email address. But on the other hand, if it's a physician or if it's a 
if someone belonging to the group, they should be able to see the email address. So we are trying to kludge that into it. All right. Are you guys coming? I want to give Patrick a little flavor. I should introduce Patrick Winston. And uh, he's going to be teaching here soon, so he wants to see what it looks like. All right. So that's what students look like. Um, so we're gonna. This is the final lecture from uh, 6916 last semester at MIT, um, and the goal here is to understand a little bit about the future of the relational database management system. So it's an old system that you've been um, using this semester, going going back to uh, EF Cod, I guess, at IBM in 1970 was the first uh, guy to lay out the relational calculus and say this is how database management systems really ought to be built and ought to be queryable. Uh, the product that you've been using, uh, Oracle, in some cases, goes back about 25 years. A Microsoft SQL Server is originally the Sybase codebase, which goes back probably 15 years. So these are old systems. They do have a future. And the future <coughs> generally <coughs> gets around having richer data types. So we talked about this a little bit in the normal form lecture, where we said that uh, actually having data types that were at the intersection that could be completely specified by table name, column name, and key was a good thing. So compound data types aren't necessarily an improvement, but richer data types, such as being able to store photographs and uh, resize them, or text documents and index them in some interesting way. Um, that's uh, sometimes classed under the rubric of object relational. Class hierarchies and tables, we've talked about that a fair amount this semester where you have a base t table such as content and then you have tables that inherit all their columns from content plus have additional columns, say, such as a threading sort key for a B-board table. That's another area of innovation. Native XML support, we'll talk about that a bit today. but a lot of people want to store XML documents. And you might say, well, what's the big deal? I'll just put them in a CLOB data type. That can be up to four gigabytes in size. I'm not going to have an XML document bigger than that. So there's no problem with storing XML in the database. The question then becomes, how do you query into that database? So if you have a million XML documents, um, Oracle can store them. The question is, how do you query for an XML document which contains a particular value in a subtag without scanning through all million documents in your database. Because if you have to examine your entire database every time you do a query, that's going to be mighty slow. You've seen that there are procedural or imperative languages inside the RDBMS in addition to the SQL parser. So in the case of Oracle, you've got PLSQL and Java as options. In the case of Postgres, I guess you've got uh, PG, SQL, and Tickle. Uh, Microsoft SQL Server, I guess the, with the next version, you'll be able to use any of the .NET languages within SQL Server. So there's a whole lot of imperative languages that you can run inside the database. The people, the people who make standards, they don't look at diversity as a virtue. So there's an effort to standardize the imperative languages that people use within the database, something taking something like Oracle PL SQL and turning that into an ISO standard. Uh, standards for management of external data. So what do you do when a whole bunch of the data that you need to satisfy a query resides in a legacy database within your organization, resides out on the internet on a website? Um, we'll talk about that. We've talked a little bit about scaling and redundancy. There's people who've been working on that as well. Let's see what we can say about some of this. Um, let's actually go right into native XML support. Oh. Okay, so this is a hidden book chapter from a hidden book, and it's about, shouldn't really be called, well, I guess it 
It's a book it's supposed to be a book on Java. It's not really about Java and XML. So here's uh, positing some instrument data from a parabola instrument at NASA. Um, directional radiative flux in a custom space separated format. As you can see, even when you have a PhD, the guy who wrote this is a PhD in something or other, but not in orthography. Um, okay, so here, instead of having a, a tab separated format, essentially, we've turned this into XML, where you've got uh, I don't know what this is. I guess this is the same data that we had up there. So zenith, azimuth, and then the measurements on three different channels. Um, here's a DTD for that XML document. So remember that the DTD is something that can tell an authoring tool or a consumer of XML how to automatically set up a parser for XML documents. So a DTD helps you. Uh, helps, let's say, an editor present a nice user interface for a user <coughs> in uh, entering an XML document, and uh, it also helps parse. So again, if you just want to have, if you just want to store this in Oracle, um, the integer document ID in a CLOB column, and you're done. Everybody's happy. <coughs> what if you want to pull it out? Well, there's this thing called Simple API for XML that will parse XML and then give you access to a particular document. So here you can validate it. You can search through it. I don't think we show the bad old way of doing it. But basically, the answer in Oracle is that none of the indexing methods, we, we showed you the B-tree index in an earlier lecture, where uh, a var char or an integer column could be indexed into a binary uh, tree. But um, the problem with that is those mechanisms just don't work with XML documents. So you basically have had two choices. One is to parse your XML, rip the whole thing apart, and store the same data into tables and rows. So you certainly can do that in all cases. You can always, especially if your XML documents all have the same structure, then you can always find some relational uh, way of representing those data, at which point you can apply standard B-tree indices to the problem. There's a few limitations on that approach. First of all, it's going to be pretty expensive to do all this, to take them apart and put them back together all the time. But the deeper problem is that you may have a heterogeneous data set. You may have a million XML documents and uh, you know half a million DTDs. Um, so they may have all kinds of different types, and at that point, it becomes very hard to build any kind of index because your data won't fit in the same tables. You're going to have to have essentially uh, you know, a new table for each uh, kind of XML document. All right, so Oracle provides <coughs> uh, a way of cheating, and the way of cheating is basically to hijack the full text indexer. So they've always had the system to do full text indexing of natural language documents to reach into a CLOB or varchar column and pull out all the little bits of text and index those. So what they've done is they've augmented their intermediate text system to understand the XML document type. And that gives you some new power that you don't have with standard English, like uh, saying, OK, I want to search for the following word or the following value within these uh, two, uh, within, within, within a certain tag. So that gets you query performance. It doesn't get you a lot of the stuff that you might want. So what might you want? You might want, let's say you had all those instrument data in your database. You might want to do a group by and an average and a whole bunch of other SQL uh, statistical kinds of processing. And uh, you, you won't be able to do that without you know, writing a bunch of Java procedures to pull the XML apart and essentially doing a sequential table scan. So you have a terrible performance hit. Uh, if you need to do an average. If you just need to find a particular document, this approach may enable you to do it while only looking at an index and not scanning the whole table. Uh, but it, it's an imperfect solution. Um, people are working on this and getting better native support for XML. It's not there yet. As soon as you see a data type called CLOB, 
instead of XML document, you know that you're dealing with a database that really doesn't have what people want. There are folks working on this. There's people with research projects doing 100% native XML databases. Um, I'm not sure how successful they're going to be because there's a lot of things that made the relational database very popular that they haven't really implemented. Patrick has to leave soon, so we're going to try to give him a flavor of some interesting stuff here. Here's a chapter of your SQL for Web Nerds book. And I guess the... Um, I'll tell you an Ars Digital story to get this thing. This actually comes from the MIT Sloan School also. So some guys from the MIT Sloan School decided to solve a problem. So the problem they decided to solve was what they called aggregation. So they said, well, you'd really like to do a query or some transaction across, you know, maybe some data here at a bank. And, uh, you know, some data over here at a brokerage. And some data over here that, uh, I don't know, a retailer. And maybe you, the user, sitting in a browser, I'm going to query this one server, pull data from these three sources, and get one web page, maybe showing your bank balance, how many stocks, shares of stock you own from this brokerage, and how much you bought from this retailer. And maybe, you know, if we make it really fancy, you'll be able to do transactions like move some money from the bank to the brokerage. So they called this aggregation. They said, let's build an aggregation server. All right. So they came up with, they built their own server of sorts. And they came up with an SQL-like query language. So basically, you could pull all these data down onto your local hard drive, store them somewhere, and then query into them with a SQL-like query language. All right, what do you guys think of this approach? Does it make sense? And in particular, coming up with a new SQL-like query language and a new execution environment for that query language. Given that we just talked about having a relational database management system, one of the big headers. We haven't actually really talked about it because we're doing this a bit out of order so as not to put Patrick to sleep. But we just talked about RDBMS plus things like Java and PL SQL and anything that runs in .NET running inside the database. It certainly ought to have all the power that you need for doing all of this without throwing another layer of so what are you saying? Instead of building your own application server, your own SQL-like query language, and your own SQL parser, what would you do instead? You need something here, right? You don't have... There's simply some, some way to couch your queries in an acceptable form for whatever system you're sending off to and do it there. Use XML and SQL to... Okay, use XML. That's always a good way to keep your job. <laughs> Just keep saying use XML. All right, who has a, a more explicit idea of what we're actually going to do? We've written this big pile of C code and Perl and stuff to do this job. What's an actual concrete idea for making this a better system? That's true, although they, they may, some of them may be cooperative and some of them may just give you web pages that you have to parse with regex, so you can't really be sure what's going to happen. So I'm talking about stuff that you can actually control. Remember, this is on your box. Everything else is on somebody else's box. So what can you do on your box to make this a better engineered system? So right now, like I said, we have a bunch of custom code. 
We have our own computer language. We have our own parser for our own computer language. Can you just build an interface to go between each system and the computer itself and interface, write your code to work with that interface? Um, well, that's sort of what we've done, right? The, this, this guy maybe is giving us HTML pages. That's our interface. And we've written some code to go between that interface and our computer. This guy's maybe giving us some nice XML document. We've written some code to parse that. So then why do you need to create all this other stuff if you could use existing existing tools to... Well, you have, we have used existing tools. We've used a C compiler. We've used a Perl compiler. We've used a regex. Those are existing tools. I mean, you can't find something that will parse the home runs web pages off the shelf because that's not a very common format. Nobody has any ideas? What? You're going to maintain this code base, this language, and this parser for the rest of your life? Well, no, look. What we want is a little module that will take a home run's home page, translate it into a format that we care about. Yeah. Um, and yes, you'll have to maintain that if you can't get the cooperation of... of where, and where are you going to execute that? Well, you most likely execute it on your system then. Well, I think that's a fair statement that you're eventually going to execute it on your computer <laughs> since these guys aren't going to let you use theirs. Where's the elephant in the room? <laughs> this here? How is it useful? Well, if we could fill it up. Maybe by PLSQL inside the um, database, it can do the queries to the foreign servers, ask them what's new. Okay, so what are you actually proposing replacing with what? Uh, I'm going to C++ plus plus modules that understand home run would be trans would be written into Java or PLSQL inside of. Okay, so there's a Perl. Let's say there's a Perl script here with a regex that understands home runs. Yeah. You're going to propose to move that where? Into the PLSQL or Java. Into here. In, into there. Let's call it Java plus regex. And hopefully we can find some generality so that other sites are like Home Run, or hopefully we can be notified when Home Run stops working and we'll have to go back and recode this. But All right, but be, before you move this code over here, there's a something else you have to do. Right, this is not part of your system right now. Let's draw now. Okay. <laughs> well, so you're still, but you're still saying you want to have your own SQL language, like no, no, language. The, the, the wonderful access we've got with Intermedia and, and SQL and SQL Plus into our Oracle database, that's what we want. We don't want to build a halfway like so you're not, language halfway like that. So you're not going to build this anymore. Correct. Our queries will now be the full power. All right. So the engineering, the first engineering step is throw all this code out and replace it with a standard RDBMS. Right. As soon as somebody tells you, I have a system that has a SQL, that has a declarative query languages, a declarative query language, actually you can run C inside Oracle as well, if you're willing to live dangerously, although they sandbox it off in some other process, so if it crashes, it doesn't trash your data. If somebody tells you, you have a system with uh, a SQL-like language called SQL, um, and three Turing complete computer languages that can execute inside um, the already purchased and already beloved execution environment, then the proper engineering approach to this problem is probably to say, well, you already like talking to Oracle, so let's just make this entire system run inside Oracle. So actually what these guys didn't realize is that IBM Almaden Research Center in San Jose had come to the same conclusion. They've been working on this problem for six years it just shows you that, um, you know, spending uh, two years in the lab can sometimes save you uh, two hours in the library. Um, <laughs> so if they had gone to the library, they would have seen, or gone to the web, they would have seen all these papers from the group at uh, IBM Almaden, which starting, I guess, 1993, 94, had built something sort of like this. They built this object database. They called it garlic, I think. And uh, they started adding stuff to garlic to make it go up, be able to go out and fetch data out there on the public internet or from uh, legacy systems and so forth. 
And they published a bunch of stuff about it. And after a while, they came to the conclusion, you know, well, people want this ability, but they don't want our experimental database. They don't really want an object database. What they want is a relational database. So let's take, they took IBM's, uh, they didn't use Oracle because they're at IBM, and this is the group where they developed the relational database to begin with. They then developed System R, which was an experimental implementation. And then from that, uh, IBM built this DB2 product, which is very similar to Oracle. So they took DB2, they added some modules uh, on the back end of DB2 to be able to go out onto the web or out to a uh, old mainframe, fetch data and uh, bring it back and make it available uh, as uh, SQL views, essentially, of these foreign data. And you could specify rules for caching, like, you know, don't go to the bank 100 times a second if you have to do a bunch of joins cache it for some configurable amount of time. So they actually, um, they built the system. They shoved it into DB2, which also has some kind of Turing complete computer language that can run inside DB2. Um, and uh, they published the results. And then they went to the uh, ANSI standard committee on SQL, and they actually got this adopted into the SQL standard SQL 99 standard, I think, as uh, SQL MED, uh, SQL dash MED of manage management of external data. Mm -hmm. So, but meanwhile, like I said, these folks at the Sloan School were unaware of any of this research, of any of this uh, standardization process. Um, and so they did all of this work because they didn't understand that you might as well just have a Java procedure inside Oracle going out onto the web, fetching your data, bringing it back, anything you can do in uh, you know, your own custom system you can do inside Oracle. And uh, that's, in fact, what people want. So basically, uh, this is something that you cannot do as part of the raw Oracle 8.1.7 distribution. They haven't implemented the SQL 99 standard yet. It's coming, however. And in the meantime, this chapter actually shows you some interesting ways to do it with uh, your own Java procedures stuffed into Oracle. I believe with Oracle 9, there's going to be some much more powerful ways of doing this because there's an API into the query processor. So you can actually interrupt Oracle's processing <coughs> of SQL queries and go and execute bits of Java code. Um, so basically what you want is you want to be able to produce um, a... Uh, and it's actually a bit easier in Postgres to do something like this. In Postgres, you can create a function that produces, uh, that returns a row set. At that point, you know, the function's results can be joined with other tables miscellaneously. And, uh, you know, the people who are doing the queries need never know that it's coming from a function, which, you know, may be going out on the public internet, may be checking in its internal cache. Um, so anyway, this is a fairly common problem, obviously, because it's now become part of the standard. And the correct way to attack it as an engineer is always to think about some standard tool um, rather than going to additional computer languages, particularly if they begin to look like SQL and additional execution environments, because definitely people who run IT systems don't like extra execution environments. You know, They certainly are happy to run things inside the database because they must run a database. You know, if you start getting into application server and web server, I guess they've begun to tolerate that. If you say, okay, I'm going to have this, you know, extra thing on the side, uh, somebody who's an engineer may start questioning you as to why do you need this extra thing on the side when you've already got the database and three Turing complete computer languages inside there. Philip? Yeah, questions about this approach? Yeah, if everybody who maintains their own Oracle site has to write that uh, interpreter, that little uh, ellipse. Yeah. Is there a better way? Is there a way for a home run as a service to the outside world say, well, everybody who runs SQL queries, here's how to get at my interesting information? Oh, well, certainly there's a way for home runs to do that. I mean, basically, uh, Microsoft would say that, you know, e everybody should run Microsoft.net and expose, you know, all their data via SOAP. Um, at which point, you know, you would just need uh, enough support in your database. Well, and actually, if you were running SQL, I should become like a marketing hoe for Microsoft. <laughs> <laughs> and then if you're running, you know, SQL Server 2001 or 2002 or whatever they're going to call it, uh, you would just configure your management of external data system to know that, okay, these data are available via a SOAP call. Um, and here's the arguments that you're, you're going to have to give. 
to get the data at home runs. So yeah, Microsoft would tell you that everybody should run .NET, expose everything via SOAP, and the world would be a happy, fun place. Uh, the problem with that is that you know the home runs guys may have other priorities, so they may not want to help you out. They may say, well, we've already got this interface, and this is it. And then we, and we'll, and we'll, fulfill the we'll feel free to change it whenever we feel like, and that's life. But yeah, obviously you wouldn't use regex and uh, HTML if you didn't have to. So there could, you would have 100 peers around the country doing something similar but slightly different. Yeah, I mean the SQL management of external data spec does, it doesn't make this any easier. It gives you a place to put the regex, but ultimately if you need a regex because you can't get your data in a parsable format, um, then uh, you know you're going to have to write the regex. So all you know, the best possible system still leaves you with a task of writing a regular expression somewhere. Um, but the question is, do you stuff it into you know megabytes of your own custom code, or do you stuff it into um, you know a little tiny Java program that you've written inside Oracle 8, or do you stuff it you know in a form? that uh, you can maybe type into Oracle 9 or Oracle 10. So that's really the question. But like I said, if they're, if they're giving you HTML, you're going to have a, a hand-authored regex in there somewhere probably. Other questions? Let's see if there's anything interesting from this <laughs> chapter. All right, so basically, Overarching principle, treat foreign data as though they were residing in local SQL tables. And I say, if you physically or virtually drag foreign data back to your Oracle cave, new developers don't have to think about where data are coming from. Developers can work with foreign data using the same query language that they use every day, SQL. Um, developers can keep working with the same programming tools and systems that they've been using every day. So basically, if you build your own hairball of C code here, you're going to have your own way of connecting to it. So now if you're a COBOL programmer, you've been connecting to Oracle for 15 years, you know how to do that. Now all of a sudden you need to know not only how to um, query in this new SQL-like language, but you also have to um, you know, come up with some, some new machinery to connect to this thing. And if you look at the Ruby team this month, Right, they're getting almost nothing done because they had to figure out how to connect Ruby to no, Oracle and do connection pooling. Really? They said connection pooling was like almost there. Okay, connection pooling, <laughs> connecting to the database is no problem. Yeah, all right. But like I said, the COBOL programmer, you know, he's got his connection to the database, he's got his connection pooling, you know, he's set. Um, and uh, he doesn't want to learn anything new. Uh, with this thing, you're forcing him to learn something new just to uh, get his queries done. This way, um, you know, they already understand how to send a SQL query to Oracle and get the data back. All right. Um, we did lift up. The, we did lift the Sloan guy's terminology. It's called aggregation architecture. These guys actually. They were so confused that they, they were so confused about what they thought was their innovation, they actually started a whole company called iAggregate. <laughs> and uh, anyway, we were recruiting Alan, actually, our CEO. So we had to actually absorb these guys into Ars Digita, along with Alan, to hire Alan as a CEO. So we should have just not hired Alan. We should have said, anybody dumb enough to start a company, send it around this idea and not realize that IBM solved the same problem six years ago and got it standardized two years ago, um, shouldn't be CEO. But instead, we brought them in. And then I started, uh, like, trying to get them off of their technical architecture. So they, so they had this huge architecture. They would fill the blackboard with, they said, here's our aggregation architecture. And they would fill the blackboard with about 10 different circles, each one of which was a complete execution environment and a separate running Unix process or Windows process. And I said, there's no way that something with 10, I mean, Oracle has about six, I think, simultaneously running C programs. And you know, after 25 years, it barely works. I said, there's no way you can get something with 10 uh, separate processes that all depend on each other communicating to work 24-7. 
And then they said, well, our thing is better than just writing some Java programs inside the database because our thing is database agnostic. This is apparently some new term for you know, IT monkeys. Database agnostic, that makes it automatically better. And I said, well, given that all the people that we've ever met run Oracle and all the people with, who have any money run Oracle, you know, of what benefit is it to us to have a system that's database agnostic? And of course, you know, if you have the Java programs, you could eventually stuff them into SQL Server as soon as the next release comes out and it'll run C sharp code. So anyway, uh, they accomplished nothing. I couldn't even get them to write down what problem they thought they were solving. I finally had to get, this one was written by Michael Booth, this Cornell uh, PhD guy who joined RS Digital, although he quit after a few months. He was so scarred by working with these guys. Um, but before he quit, he did take a week out and uh, we wrote this thing together. All right, so degenerate aggregation. Um, so we talk a little bit about Oracle to Oracle communication. If you, the data that you're trying to aggregate is um, in a separate system, but it's they're cooperating with you, you can actually select star from sales.prozac orders and pull that into your data warehouse from the, sale, the sales database or from the sales user, I should say. So there's ways of getting data around within the same Oracle database. Uh, if there are two separate machines, there's some Oracle networking that you have to do, and then you use a database link, and now you can say sales.prozac orders at online transaction processing server at OLTP. So Oracle has pretty good facilities for um, grabbing tables and joining them and so forth if they're in another Oracle system or the same Oracle system owned by a different user. Okay, um, what if you're trying to, yeah, so the example here is you want to automatically issue prescriptions for Prozac whenever an insured's employer's stock drops more than 10% in a day. This was written for the dot-com world. So basically you got patients and employers and stock quotes. So if the, um, if the, if the patient's employer has stock has tanked, then you try to find out their name so you can write them a Prozac prescription. Okay, so let's assume that, oh, actually this is a friend of mine's company, Ariba, and uh, they have gone from 173 down to seven. So Brian could probably use some, that was all written in Lisp initially, Ariba system. <coughs> Anyway, um, so we say, look, we're going to be able to get our stock quotes from quote.yahoo.com. And, you know, it would be nice if they gave it back to us in machine-readable form, but that's not really the issue, and in any case, we can parse it. So you have a coherency problem. How out of date are we going to, you know, how out of date are we going to accept these quotes? Um... It's not going to change from 4.30 p.m. until 9.30 a.m., so we don't want to keep requerying Yahoo. Um, all right. Uh, so actually, one thing we thought about at first was why not just have a stock quotes table and you define a database trigger that fires in advance of your query to make sure that the data that you're querying are present in the table and that they're not too old. So you got your trigger, it runs a little bit of code, and uh, if necessary, go, back, go out on the internet and get some stock quotes and insert them into the table before the uh, rest of the select executes and uh, has a chance to notice that things are screwed up. So if Oracle worked like AOL server, you'd be in great shape because it would run, be running this little filter, or IIS, actually, for that matter. So what's the problem with this approach? Well, as of Oracle version 8.1.6, it is impossible to define a trigger on select. A dirty little secret. Um, I believe that um, Postgres has a rule system that can intercept and transform a select. 
Um, and like I said, I'm thinking that Oracle 9 actually has something like this. But basically, triggers are considered bad. The database world does not like triggers. They're considered frills that slow your system down. So real men don't use triggers. Real database management systems like Teradata that deal with huge amounts of data warehousing data don't even implement triggers. So Oracle likes to advertise triggers, but then they tell people, oh, you shouldn't really use them because they're going to slow your system down to the point where it's unusable. So basically, they only let you do triggers, and they only check for triggers on really heavyweight operations like inserts and uh, updates and deletes. All right, so now we're really screwed. Um, so like I said, you could wait for ANSI ISO SQL 99 standard to be fully implemented. Um, you could call a checker. I don't know what that point 0.5 is. Um, Oh, if the quote is older than the specified interval, right. <laughs> yeah, so you could call this checker every time you do a, um, before every time you do a query. Um, and all this Java stuff, stock updater. Oh my god. Autonomous transaction wrapper. So anyway, Michael Booth got this whole thing to work. The checker and the fetcher, Java stored procedures. It turns out the checker has to have two layers of PL SQL. Um, you need to write an autonomous transaction because an application might call the checker in the middle of a big transaction. Right, and you don't want... Remember, the checker needs to go out to the Internet, grab some data insert it into the stock quotes table or update the stock quotes table and commit. So it's not going to be allowed to do that or it's going to be committing some half-finished uh, application stuff unless it's wrapped in an autonomous transaction. So Oracle actually lets you within a transaction say, okay, by the way, this is an autonomous transaction that I want to stand by itself and succeed or fail by itself. And if I do a commit within this autom autonomous transaction, don't commit any of the work that's already been done so far as part of the main execution. So this is why it's never simple. Remember, we started this off thinking it was going to be really trivial. We would just add a trigger to select. And then you find out, oh, no, you can't do that. So now we're down in this huge pile of hair with autonomous transactions. Yeah. But could you run a cron job and do an update twice a day just before you are about to prescribe everybody? Yeah, so the observation is maybe you could do, uh, they don't call it a cron job in Oracle, they just call it a job. Okay. It's an Oracle job. So you can run an Oracle job, or you can run a cron job that went and started off an Oracle job or an Oracle uh, program. Right, so you could just say, okay, once a day we're going to update this table on our local database because that's all we need. Um, and then you know, we know when the query is going to be run, but that's not a fully general solution. So yeah, sure, you could do that. Anyway, he, get, he gets the thing mostly working to the point where, as far as the people consuming this, this data is over three hours old. I'll have to go edit that. These data. Um, yeah, so we reference uh, the garlic project at IBM. And uh, as you can see, they're not exactly... They're not exactly hiding what they're up to. Let's see what the users have to say. Oh, NASDAQ servers make stock quotes available in XML. Ha! Huh. I didn't know this. I should start using the Gates Wealth Clock. Yeah. So here they are. You know, this is, again, I think, a relatively... Uh, New thing. Actually, we can use this for the course. That's only as of March 9th. So things are beginning. You know, like Amazon, I think, is still non-cooperating with the rest of the world um, in the sense that uh, their database is only queryable via HTML pages and specific session IDs and so forth. But all right, that was good to learn. 
All right, I think we've milked that one for what it's worth. Philip, is Amazon uh, just lazy or, or against doing this? Or I don't know. I think they're probably some combination. They're probably against doing it. They don't want to make people able to build enhanced. I think you know they're worried probably about a creative person building some kind of enhanced service but, that they haven't thought of using their database. Oracle 9i. I'm not sure when it's even going to be shipped. It was supposed to be out already, I think. I could be wrong. No. October 2nd, Oracle announced 9i. <laughs> um, New features summary. Okay, so look at this. Significant improvement in cluster database scalability with real application clusters, formerly Oracle Parallel Server. So this is, gets back to the general principle that I introduced at the beginning of the term, that whenever there's an Oracle product that doesn't work, they rename it. So nobody liked Oracle Parallel Server, so they've now renamed it, real application clusters. New high availability technology, including advances in standby database technology. So standby database Remember we said everything So here you have a database management system and remember that we said that everything was written every transaction was committed as soon as it was written to the redo log as soon as enough information was written to the redo log that you could start from some cold backup of the data files and go and reapply all the changes from redo log that we committed the transaction back to the user. And maybe we fixed up the rest of the files eventually at a checkpoint. Maybe an hour later, we'd actually write the uh, dirty blocks back from the memory into the main hard disks. So a standby database is you have another machine sitting here waiting for this one to die. Meanwhile, it's reading stuff from the redo log, more or less, as they happen. Um, I think actually it uses archive redo log, so maybe it's out of sync by some amount of time, and then it would have to go back and read the real one, just so you're not doing a lot of disk. Right? You don't want to be doing a whole bunch of disk reads on the same disk that's trying to do sequential writes. So it's getting the redo logs maybe every five or ten minutes. It gets a fresh redo log, and then it applies those to its own set of disk drives containing the data files. So then if this guy dies, you bring up your standby database. Um, you have the standby database. There's an active, this is, let's call this the archive redo logs. And this is the live redo. So basically, all the standby database has to do is finish its archive redo logs, then go and read the last up to the last transaction in the live redo logs, and away you go with your standby database. So that's another approach to high availability. It's a little simpler than Oracle Parallel Server because these machines, uh, remember, even with Oracle Parallel Server one node, two node failover configuration, there's still some communication between these two guys that is slowing you down and slowing transactions. In this case, this computer is running just as fast as it possibly can, and this guy is only reading um, the archive redo logs that have already been uh, filled up and are done with. Question? Um, so the A machine will come back, to be, will turn into standby as soon as it comes live again? Uh, I don't know. I don't think it's that automatic. Yeah. Probably have to do some massive Oracle reconfiguration on this machine to turn it into a standby machine. And there's a little slowdown on, we can't write the redo log. The head won't be in the proper position to write to the redo log because maybe the reading from the standby machine has moved it. In the, Where? In the archive redo logs. Archive redo logs are not being written. By definition, they're done. All right. You have live redo logs, maybe three of them. And uh, there's a separate process called the archiver that you write to the redo log number one, then you move to redo log number two. As you move to redo log number two, the archiver is copying redo log number one into the archives. All right. User level error correction with flashback query. We're going to get into that in a minute. Um, Anyway, the new summary 
of these things. Maybe we don't have to go down there. So basically, Oracle's pushing mostly that stuff. Flashback queries, time travel. So those of you guys who are using Postgres will say, hey, those Postgres guys had this back you know, 10 years ago. What's the big deal? So basically, the way Postgres works is completely different from Oracle. And if you modify a row, so Postgres has what's called a no override architecture, where you write down you know, row one, and then a timestamp, TS, row two, timestamp. So as you insert, this is what your database looks like. You might say, OK, that doesn't seem very innovative. And that's, in fact, how Oracle works, too. What's different is that when you update row number one, you just write it again with the new data and a new timestamp. You update row number three, timestamp. OK, so basically, you're just writing, writing, writing more and more stuff onto the disk. You're creating these huge blocks, if you're doing frequent updates, filled with garbage, old data. So this makes Postgres vastly less efficient, because when you read a block of data from the disk into the cache, you're not only, you know, if you read, yeah, if you read, let's say this forms one block on the disk, and you read it into memory, because somebody wanted data in row two, well, you're also clogging up your RAM with obsolete data from rows one and three that's no longer current and that nobody will ever be interested in. So again, this is why Oracle goes way faster than Postgres. See? Um, it's not possible for these things to maintain a pointer to the most recent version? Well, they could maintain a pointer, but again, if you're copying images off the disk into RAM, um, then uh, it's not of much help. Maybe they do. I don't think so, no. I think the whole point of no overwrite is that you never go back and touch those blocks on the disk again. Um, so the alternative is to replace the information in the block itself. Which is what Oracle does, so but it doesn't. But, it, but it's so slow that it can't do it, right? It writes to the redo log, and then you know every now and then it goes back and mungs up the blocks. It only fixes the blocks in memory. It doesn't fix them on, hard, on a hard drive. So that keeps writes from being slowed down. It, mean, it, keeps, it means that writes are sequential, right? It means that you know if you do a million writes, you're getting um, the performance of sequential writes onto a hard disk, which is much, much faster than random access to the hard disk. And then when you go and fix them up from RAM, you're generally fixing up large pieces of the database, all, again, that are physically contiguous on the hard disk. So it means you can do random writes to your database and have uh, sequential performance based on your hard disk. Postgres also gets that advantage. Postgres has to get advantage. As it does updates, it's writing sequentially to the hard drive. But like I said, you end up with these big holes in your database um, where you have you know, little bits of important data separated by um, you know, oceans of uh, garbage. Um, I don't see why the two systems have to be exclusive. If you're reading everything from a redo log anyway, couldn't you keep just two copies of your table, one current and one as the archival? Um, well, that's a good question. We're going to get into that in a second, because Oracle is now claiming that they're going to be able to do this too. Let's stick with Postgres, because this is the classical simple thing that they did. OK, so there's one thing that they can do. First of all, you can get rid of the garbage. Once a night, you can do something called a vacuum. <laughs> if you're not interested in those old data, once a night, you run vacuum, and uh, you know it'll pick up anything that hasn't been vacuumed before, uh, figure out you know what's actually current, produce some new blocks, erase all the old ones, and stuff that in. So it'll get rid of the uh, holes in your uh, table. So basically, you can clean your thing. Your, you, you can do this garbage collection operation called vacuum that will uh, clean things up. And actually, if you don't vacuum your Postgres database, you will find that it grows ad infinitum. Um, so that's a charming little aspect of Postgres administration that you guys will learn about, those of you who are using the system. So a nice side effect of this is something that they Postgres guys call time travel. Since you never deleted those data, if you don't, if you don't vacuum, you can actually set your, you can set your table in archive or no archive mode. If you set it in archive mode, 
even when you do a system-wide vacuum, the old data won't be reaped. So if you say, I'm going to query, I forget the syntax, but I think you can say select star from, you know, I don't know, table called foo, and then you say at quote, and you put in a timestamp, you know, 2001, Now, Postgres is ignoring the most recent data. It's basically saying, I'm only going to query uh, the most recent versions of the rows that are no older than this timestamp. So now you've traveled back in time to what you had on January 1st, 2000. So that's a pretty cool feature. And it has the side effect of being useful for... So or what Oracle... What Oracle said they were doing here, what do they call this? Uh, flashback query. So basically, user level error correction, that's kind of a nice way of saying if the users themselves are boneheads, and by user they mean programmer, if the programmer's a bonehead and deletes everything in the table, um, well, with flashback, uh, you know, they can always uh, get those rows back from the... Uh, it's not really from the redo log, which I guess says what to change. It's more like the rollback segment. Imagine the rollback segments. Remember we said that Oracle does already do a certain amount of time travel when you're doing queries. It's querying the database as it existed at a certain time. It reaches back into the rollback segment uh, to get those old value. I have a feeling that the way flashback works is it's a way of essentially archiving your rollback segments forever, or at least for certain tables, archiving them forever. So you can always go back into, you know, an archive rollback segment. Somebody who is a stockholder in a disk drive company, I think, must have convinced Oracle to provide this feature because. Like I said, this is like a classic. Let's turn a bug into a feature. Right? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, the Postgres guys had, they had a good. When computers were really slow, they had a good argument for this, which was that. I think I mentioned this earlier that it was. Um, there was no roll forward, that when their pile of crummy C code crashed and you had to restart the database, you didn't have to go into the redo log and try to reapply those transactions to you know, your, what had been on your hard drive in order to get the database back online. Because right? when Oracle, if Oracle crashes, which is rare, but when it does crash, you know, the stuff in your data, your current data is reflected only in RAM. That's basically the only current snapshot of the database is in RAM. So when the C programs die, that's gone. So now you have obsolete data in your data files, and you have information about how to bring them up to date in your redo log, but you may have to crunch away for a while, which on an ancient VAX or something could be quite a lot of crunching. Well, the users, they're already upset because the database crashed, and now they're upset because they have to wait another 15 minutes while it rolls forward. So the Postgres guys, you know, again, they were starting this in around 1990. They said, well, this is a bad thing, and we're going to fix that problem by having a no overwrite architecture. So we'll have instant, the database will come, out, come, up, come back up instantly. So the problem with that is computers have gotten so fast now that rolling forward I don't think is that big a deal. And also Oracle's stopped crashing. So their competition has stopped crashing, um, more or less. Time travel, what else do we have to say about databases? Um, yeah, inspiration for MIT students. Um, what did I say about, well, no, let's not get into that. <laughs> yeah, I was telling these other these students. Um, an established company may have people from whom you can learn. An established company may have resources over which you'll give, be given control. So I tell my MIT students not to go work out of their house because even if they achieve 2,000% ROI, a 2,000% return on an investment of $100 is not going to be very noticeable by the rest of the world. Whereas if they go to work for GE and get handed some million-dollar factory to manage or multi-million-dollar business to manage or something, even if they only get a 15% return, that's going to create enough of a stir. Somebody asked me if it was worth working, if it was still worth having started my own company, given that even then the students had realized that Ars Digital was cratering. So I said, well, it's still worth it because um, you get to work with your friends. So that's the luxury of having your own 
organization. Uh, and I, I guess, already had figured out that professionals, professional managers cannot help your business, that you have to kind of do the grunt work yourself for a long, long time and train new managers very slowly. All right, uh, that's the database. I don't think there's much interesting to say about the stuff that we skipped. Uh, PL SQL is an Oracle proprietary standard. Some people would say that Java will save us, and the question is, will it? And I think the answer is no, that Java is actually the wrong programming language for inside the database. If you look at PL SQL is kind of a painful language in which to write because the programming tools are so primitive, although maybe there's some better ones that I don't know about. But certainly if you're typing away in Emacs and copying it over into SQL Plus uh, and it's not, and Oracle's not happy with your PL SQL, you don't get a very informative message about that. However, if you look at a SQL program to say implement a, tr a PL SQL program to implement a trigger versus an Oracle program that does the same thing, you know, the Oracle program is 10 times as long. It's got extremely verbose access to uh, the structures inside the database, even if that access were efficient underneath. It's so inefficient from a programming point of view that I think there is actually a continued need for a procedural language that's much closer to the database. Oracle has tried to solve this a bit. They have something called SQL J, which is a preparser on Java that lets you have SQL statements inside Java um, and do some compile time checking, I guess. Uh, but PL SQL is nice. You know, for example, what's the difference between PL SQL and, say, uh, your C-sharp code or Visual Basic or AOL Server Tickle? Um, if you are coding away in C-sharp and you reference a table that doesn't exist in your database, you don't find out about that until runtime. You're checking along, going through your site, and because as far as C-sharp is concerned, that table name is a perfectly valid little string. Well, it's only at runtime that Oracle says, well, that perfectly valid little string in C-sharp doesn't mean anything to me as a table name. Whereas if you're coding PL SQL, you get much more reliable queries and access to the database structures because it's going to tell you in advance, no, I'm not even going to accept that PL SQL procedure. I'm not going to let you define it unless all the tables that you reference are actual tables in the system. And your local variables can have things like data types that point back to the database. So you can say this local variable is equal to, this local, the type of this local variable is um, the same as the bboard tables one line summary column, same type. All right, questions about the future of the database? Well, there's, a, there's a company down the block called Inner Systems, I think, they make a product called Cache Shape, do you know that? Inner Systems is an ancient, um, medical database that was called Mumps before, and it was developed at Mass General in the 70s. Uh, so it's one of those old uh, hierarchical databases, basically, um, which predated the relational database. So it was one of the things that the database, relational database people thought they were killing off oops, when they were producing the relational database, and in fact, they did kill it off. There was an argument for a while. The, the hierarchical databases have the property that if you want to, certain kinds of queries are very, very fast, depending on the structure and how you're chasing the pointers. If you change your mind about how you want to query, you get you know, terrible, terrible query performance. Um, so that's why they were discarded. The relational databases at first provided much, much slower access, you know, the quote normal, the normal path to getting to some data was actually a lot slower in the early relational systems. So. You know, things like the airline reservation system still run on, you know, these old style hierarchical databases. If you were, like I said, though, to do, if you want to do a weird query, like show me all the customers of the airline who've flown to, you know, Bangkok. If you were ever to go into that mainframe and try to query out the data in, in an unanticipated way for airline flights, you know, it would take a year to satisfy your query because you'd have to basically paw through every byte on the hard drive you know, in your application program. There's no support for it to query it, and it would be unbelievably slow if there were. Because um, you can't do things like create arbitrary indices. Basically, the indi Actually, a, a good way to think of a hierarchical database, in a way, is to think about the or what we showed, the Oracle indexed organized table. Right? It essentially is a B tree of some sort. The data are carried along with there, and if you're querying only in this one way, it's very fast. But if you're querying in any other way, Welcome to sequential scanning. 
So Inner Systems is, um, yeah, basically this ancient hierarchical style database. They have um, some medical applications on top of it that lets you run a hospital. I don't think they have any new customers. I think they have basically only the legacy hospitals. They have, um, but they got. On the site, now, the reason I have some connections is because they're recruit. I made a connection for them to recruit here and stuff, and I know some people who work there. But, uh, yeah, you definitely don't want to work there. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're touting on their website. I don't know if we can find it here, but, but they're touting on their website a post-relational database system. And one of our students asked me, what does that mean? And I felt either ignorant or that they made it up. And I think they made it up. You haven't heard that term as, as, as a well... No, it's the, well, it's their ancient crummy system that they're now calling post-relational. Um, there are things that these things will do yeah, it should come as no surprise. Blah blah blah. Is, um, is yeah, the post-relational is database for web apps? Yeah, what does that mean? Have you ever heard that term before? Or did they make it up? No, they made it up. Okay. Um, That's what I said, but I wasn't sure. I hate to say somebody makes something up, and I just put it down. Massive scalability and lightning-fast performance. A unique web architecture. Cache server pages run on the cache data server, taking advantage of fast in-process access to data. Oh, just like Oracle 817, <laughs> right? Oracle 817 has a built-in web server, and uh, it runs in the same process as the Oracle server, and it has in-process access to the data. Um, so this is hopeless, basically, pretty much, because really high volume, like I was saying about Oracle 817, even Oracle tells you not to use that web server. They say only use our built-in web server if you know you have an internet application or something where you know scalability isn't that big a deal and maybe a four processor machine is going to be all you need forever. But what real people want to do is separate the page scripting and development and construction and so forth from the database server so that you can apply more processors to the problem. And so as soon as you say that you know your data server is also going to have to compose your web pages and do the template merging and so forth you're saying that you're never going to get more than, I don't know, 64 processors onto your problem. I guess that's how many you can probably get in the Sun E10,000. Scalable, because the web server doesn't get bogged down with lots of resource-intensive processing. Again, that's kind of silly when you can have 254 web servers. I actually discovered at the Dell site the other day that Dell is selling the uh, load balancers, the F5 load balancers that I mentioned you can now buy from Dell for $7,000. They licensed the software from F5. Anyway, that's lame. Okay. <laughs> Partners Healthcare. Yeah, but it just proves that marketing, I mean, it was certainly something that nobody wanted. And I guess their marketing people have come up with a, an angle that at least hooks people in. And if you don't know what it's, if you don't know what it is, oh, that's that ancient mass general system. Um, you'll hang out there. <laughs> Who else has a question about database? Nobody? <laughs>